Hey! 
to look at some other things this morning. And the first one I want you to look at is Luke chapter 13, verse 34. Luke chapter 13, verse 34. Keep your finger there, and then we will go to Mark chapter 11 and read verses 1 through 10. Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. We all know today is one of those special days. The day that Jesus rode triumphantly into Jerusalem. And what a wonderful day it could have been for the Jewish people. But to their disgrace and the dismay of others, they welcomed Him as a conquering king. And just a few days later, they crucified him as a sinner. Terrible dark day, the day of crucifixion. But this morning we want to look at uh, Luke chapter 13 first. And please stand in reverence for the reading of God's word. We're going to read verse 34. <clears throat> Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her? How often I wanted to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her chicks under their, her wing. But you were not willing. See, your house is abandoned to you, I tell you. You will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now look at Mark 11, verses 1 through 10. When they approached Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, 
He sent two of his disciples and told them, Go into the village ahead of you. As soon as you enter it, you will find a coat tied there on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it and will send it back here right away. So they went and found the coat outside in the street, tied by the door. They untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the coat? And they answered them just as Jesus had said. So they let them go. They brought the donkey to Jesus and threw their clothes on it. And he sat on it. Many people spread their clothes on the road. And others spread leafy branches from the palms. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. This morning, I want to share a message with you entitled, Deja Vu, all over again. And you'll understand that title in just a few moments. Let's pray together. Father, our God, we stand before you this morning on this beautiful Palm Sunday. Lord, we know what a day of victory it was when Jesus rode in to Jerusalem. But how sad his heart must have been for being God's own son. He already knew that those people that were Shouting Hosanna would not many days pass be shouting crucify. Crucify Jesus who is called the Christ. Lord, as we come to this time of worship this morning, help us do a checkup in our life. Have we been guilty of praising the Lord and shouting glory to his name and then turning our back just as they did a few days later after Palm Sunday on the Lord and Master of all creation. Lord, this morning, when we leave this place, help us to be different people than when we came in. We don't come here, Lord, simply to hear a sermon. We come here to be touched by the Holy Spirit and to be changed by the power of your love and your grace. So, dear God, apply to each heart this message. And Lord, where changes are needed, may we make those changes. But may we be very careful, Lord, from this day on, never to shout glory to Jesus one day and through our actions crucify him the next. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> It's strange how we <clears throat> today seem to want to criticize others that have done these awful things toward Jesus. But yet, we're slow to remember that but for the grace of God, there go I. The word deja vu is one that many people throw around when things happen that seem that they've been through or been to that place before or they've been through that situation before, they'll say it's deja vu. I had a friend who used to say when something felt familiar to him, it is deja vu all over again, which that's basically what it means to begin with. He was simply trying to say what has happened before is now happening again. And I want you to know something this morning. I'll finally turn my mic on so you can hear it. I want you to know something this morning. And that is, as we sit here on this Palm Sunday, 2022, we can see that not much has changed in 20, uh, some 2,000 plus years. For on that road that day were people that were so excited they had never been like this before. They had never felt the spirit and the, the power that was there when Jesus came riding in on that car.
colt of a donkey. And as he rode in, they were so swept up in the moment that some were cutting branches off the palms and casting them before him and waving them in praise, shouting Hosanna. Some were so taken up by the spirit of the moment that they ripped off their outer garments, their coats, and laid them in front of the donkey for Jesus to ride over. Yes, they couldn't praise him enough. Oh, Jesus was so special on that day. But do you know why he was so special to them? Not because they wanted to serve him, but because they thought that he had come to serve them. For the Jewish people had the believing belief rather that their king would come riding on the coat of a donkey and that he would be a great conqueror and that he would put all of the enemies of the Jews under his feet and that there would be bliss and happiness from that day forevermore. What do you think about Jesus this morning? Do you come here every Sunday waiting for Jesus to do something for you? Or do you come here to do something for Christ? Devote your heart more to Jesus. Say, Lord, I want this to be a time like when you rolled into Jerusalem, only I don't want it to last for a few days. I want it to get into my spirit, into my heart, and last forever until I see you face to face in glory. But you know what? Most of us are too much like that crowd that day. We can get all excited in church on Sunday, but then we act like we never knew him on Monday. Let me ask you, are you guilty? Have you done that in your life? Are you doing that in your life? First, I want you to notice that they praised him. Verse 9, And they that went before and they that followed <coughs> cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. Don't you understand? <coughs> These people were literally out of control. You got to know about the Jewish people. <clears throat> they don't show emotions in public. They're a very staunch people. And for them to line that road that day and literally worship and praise went into overdrive in their life to the point that they were not even aware of what they were doing. You say, well, preacher, how can you say that? Because had they been aware of what they were saying and what they were doing when Jesus rode by them that day, they would have forever served him as the Messiah that they claimed. But they were just swept up in the moment. So much so that they even began to take off the expensive coats, outer garments that they had, and lay them in the dirt of the filthy streets of Jerusalem. So that as he rode over them, it was an indicator that they were casting themselves before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. They were worshiping as a king, not as a peasant itinerant preacher as they'd done so long. For three years they had talked about this unusual preacher that went about preaching things that they'd never heard before. For three years they had talked about a man that if you see him or if you hear him, he'll change you completely. But now they weren't talking that anymore. They were talking about a man that was king, a conquering king, a warrior king, a man who was not only riding a lowly donkey, but one what day would ride a beautiful white charger with a sword in one hand and a crown on his head and all the enemies of earth would be placed beneath his feet. That's why they ran that day up and down the street and shouted Hosanna. 
which literally means blessed, is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Now let me ask you something. What's wrong with that? Not a thing. If you mean it. And if it's for real. But if you're doing it for a day or for a moment, it's blasphemous toward the Lord. For you literally are saying something that you have no intention of living. And that's what happens to some of us as we approach Easter each year. I used to have a man in a church. I served in Alabama. And I went there as a very young pastor. And this guy encouraged me to be loud and strong. Because every time I'd speak a phrase, he'd say, preach it, preacher. Hallelujah. Tell him sinners. Amen. That went on all the time. Well, I was feeling pretty good about myself because I was young and dumb and knew nothing. <laughs> then I went back to the back door and one of the deacons took my hand and he said, preacher, don't pay that guy no attention. He said, he's a, weak, he's a National Guard Christian. I said, what? What do you mean? He said, he only shouts those things on Sunday, but he lived like the devil the rest of the week. For those of you who don't know, they used to call the National Guard the weekend warriors. But now they serve as regular as the Army does. But I found this out the hard way that the, man, the deacon was right. I went to a convenience store one day, got picked up a few things to take home on my way from the church to home, and there two people in front of me was my National Guard Christian with three cases of beer. He must have been thirsty. <laughs> he turned around and saw that it was a preacher, and he said, oh, preacher, this looks funny. I said, I'm not laughing. He said, well, you got to understand, I've got a friend that's bed bound and can't get out, and he asked me to buy some beer for him. I said, if he's your friend, why are you going to assist him in sinning? And he said, well, I'm doing this to get into his confidence so that I can witness to him about Jesus. Sure you are. Well, several weeks later, now remember, I've only been on the field about three weeks. Several weeks later, I was going home on Friday evening. I've been out visiting some folks. And there fell a fellow falling along the side of the road. But my first instinct was he, he must be sick or he tripped and hurt himself. So I stopped and went over to see if I could help. When I reached down to pick him up, he looked up and saw the preacher's face. And he said, hallelujah, praise God, preacher. I prayed that God would bring you by. Because I just led my friend to Jesus and he's coming to church with me on Sunday. I thought, yeah, that's probably going to happen. All right. Well, make a long story short, the man never came to church. But my National Guard Christian was there every Sunday. When he'd go out the door after he'd pray, shouted, preach to those sinners, preacher, hallelujah, all through the service, amen. He would come out the door and he would say to me, boy, did they need that today. You got that bunch of sinners, preacher. I thought to myself, brother, the only sinner I see around here is one that's holding my hand. <laughs> But you know he never changed all the years I was there as his pastor. He was always the same. I can truthfully say, and I'm ashamed to say this, that he's the only man I can remember ever praying, Lord, please stop him from coming to church. He was an embarrassment to the church. Everybody knew what he was and they made fun of him and they would say, that's the kind of people that's down there at that church. They're all like that. And I thought to myself, you're doing more harm for, for God and for His church than you'll ever do good. You see, I bring this up because three days had passed since they met Jesus coming in on that donkey's coat and shouting Hosanna. 
And something changed. No longer were they shouting praises, but they began to follow the mob that was accusing him of not being the Messiah, but being a liar. Things changed completely. So the first thing I want you to notice is that they praised him. How many of us praise him on Sunday and go out to our place of work on Monday and participate in telling dirty jokes? Or at least laugh at them. How many of us feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in our heart on Sunday morning, but then we go out and live like Jesus doesn't exist the rest of the week? The world is falling apart. My life is not worth living. Everything's wrong. You know, it makes you wonder when people praise Him how long it's going to take for them to disavow Him. Many, many Christians sit on church pews on Sunday morning and on the devil's stool on Saturday night. You see, what I want you to understand on this Easter Sunday, I mean Palm Sunday, is it's deja vu all over again. We still praise Him, and then we act like He's nobody to us. He's a rank stranger, as they used to say in the country. Just a rank stranger. I don't know Him. The second thing I want you to understand is they forgot Him. Mark chapter 14, verse 43 says, And immediately while He yet spake, cometh Judas and one of the twelve. And with him, listen to this now, and with him a great multitude with store, swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now, have you ever wondered how they got that many people together so fast? Judas went to tell the chief priests which, of course, the scribes and the Pharisees would have been there to, understand, to hear that. But where did this great multitude, as it says, with swords and staves come from? Would you believe, according to the Jewish historian Josephus, that that multitude was made up of the very people that had thrown palm branches before him and their coats on the ground when he came into Jerusalem. And now they came with swords and clubs. And they wanted one thing. They wanted him to be taken prisoner and put to death. They despised Jesus. And let's, let's do a little check up here. How quick do we forget what Jesus is in our life or who he is in our life? You know, it doesn't take much to go wrong in a person's life. You won't see them at church anymore. You'll go visit them and they'll say, well, I don't see no reason to come to church anymore, preacher. I tried to be faithful. I tried to tithe and do the right thing. And look what happened. If Jesus really loved me, he wouldn't let this happen to me. And I always say to you, you don't look for the pain in any situation. You look for the blessing. Because everything that God allows to happen in our life has a blessing attached to it. Something good comes out of everything. So let me ask you this morning. Do you remember back in September the 11th, 2001, when the trade centers fell, trade towers. You remember how people prayed to God, how they rushed into the church. We were in the city. We had to leave our church doors open so people could come in and pray. Every day at dinner, we had the doors open and uh, people there to counsel with folks, myself included. And people would, instead of eating, come from the factories that were close around the church 
And they would come to church just to kneel at the altar or just to sit on the bench and, and meditate and feel the presence of God because they were terrified. They didn't know what was coming next. And then there was this thing that sold out that no one had even thought of buying beforehand. The American flag. You had to wait weeks to get an American flag. Because they couldn't make them fast enough. Oh yeah. Our hearts were beating red, white, and blue. But you know what happened 60 days after that? Attendance turned to normal again. In six months, the flag was very seldom displayed. You didn't see it much. In fact... We've become so bold and so sure of ourselves now that we could handle Saddam Hussein, that we could take care of anything that came to America. They don't mess with America. If they do, they'll regret it. We were a proud bunch. But on the same level, not only did we quit displaying the flag, but we started calling for the Ten Commandments be taken down in every federal building. Rip them off the wall. We don't need them anymore. Even though God had gave one of the greatest victories ever when we invaded and went after Saddam Hussein. In a matter of hours, it was over. God did that. We didn't do that. But we thought we did, so we just don't need God anymore. Take those things down. And then our wonderful politicians, bless their heart. They have got a movement going to remove from the national, from the Pledge of Allegiance, one nation under God. They didn't want us to say that anymore. Couldn't have pledged your allegiance to God anymore. And then we went completely crazy, as you know, for the last four or five years. We lost our mind completely. And then we say, well, how did these people stand along those narrow lanes and worship the one who came in the way that the prophets had said, that he would enter, their Messiah would enter on sitting on a coat that had never been ridden before. They knew who he was. They knew the laws and the prophets backwards and forwards, upside down, inside out. There was no doubt what was going on. But in just a few days, they hated him with every ounce of their being. To the point that they were really willing to run him through with a sword, to beat him to death with a club, whatever it took, just get rid of the troublemaker that we praised a few days earlier. You see what I mean by deja vu all over again? America's doing that right now. We've always saw ourselves as the greatest nation on earth because we were a nation that was founded upon the principles of the Bible. We were a nation that believed in one and only true God of heaven and earth, the creator of all that there is. And now we're a nation of people saying, we don't need that God anymore. We're going to start glorifying sin. We're going to start letting people live alternate lifestyles, and you better not say anything about it unless you want to go to jail. And folks, I always tell folks, I can't but talk about it. I have to. Because there is a chapter in the Bible that talks about a city called Sodom and Gomorrah that does not exist. They can't even find the ashes of it. Just because they were doing what America wants to do today. It's deja vu all over again. Well, first they praised him, and then they forgot him. And finally they crucified him. Mark 15 verse 13. And they cried out again. Crucify. Crucify him called the Christ. 
I know that some of us saintly souls are asking, how could a person have that cold and black of a heart? To turn their back upon Jesus, the Lord and Master, God's only begotten Son, the one that was present at the creation of all that was created. The one that loved us so much that when his father said, Son, I'm going to do away with all mankind because there's great sin upon the earth. Jesus was willing to go and live among us here on this earth. Leave that heavenly home and come to earth for 33 years to love us, to forgive us, to encourage us, and to save us. He didn't come because He had to come. He came because He loved you and me more than He loved Himself. It was His desire that none perish, no, not one. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. That's Jesus' way of saying, you either serve me or you serve Satan. Let me ask you something this morning. If people looked at your life when you're alone, and when you think nobody else is looking, and saw what you did, the places you go, the things you say, the things you buy, the things you watch and read, would they believe in Jesus? Or would they say like his crowd, he's not real, just crucify him. I've heard so many times in my ministry, people say, I'd be better off when I sin, I'd be better off going to a bar because those folks will forgive me. But if you go to church and you've done something outside that really got attention, they'll never forget it and they'll never forgive you. Isn't that sad? What's the problem? It's deja vu all over again. We're repeating exactly what happened on Palm Sunday over 2,000 years ago. Dr. R.G. Lee, the pastor for 52 years of the great First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas. Preached to hundreds of thousands of people over his lifetime. And he made this statement in that huge church one Sunday morning on a Palm Sunday. He said, I just wish that I could believe and say with confidence that at least 10% of those who worship here on Sunday we're saved. That's brutal, isn't it? He said, I lay awake at night thinking about the fact that I've spent every ounce of my strength, every fiber of the love that I have loving these people and caring for each one. But then you act like you don't know Jesus. You backbite each other. You get out in the community and you spread gossip. You act as if the church is a playground on Sunday and doesn't exist the rest of the week. I just wish, he said, that 10% of you I can know that are truly saved. I could rest at night. Folks, that's his way of saying there's a whole lot of the people that were at Palm Sunday and a lot of us today. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 14 says, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit for there is no new thing under the sun. That was Solomon's way, the preacher of Ecclesiastes saying that nothing's changed much in 2,000 and some odd years from that first Palm Sunday. It still continues. Now I want you to think about this for a moment. 
that's not going to be comfortable. How many people have you talked about in the past few weeks? Oh, preacher, I wouldn't do that. Watch out now, you're in the house of God. Don't lie, sitting here in the house of God. How many people have you been angered by? And you think, well, you know what? They won't do that to me again. They'll rue the day that they did that to me because they're going to suffer. I'm going to make them feel it from now on. How many times have you made excuses for not coming to church? Look around you today. Bless your heart for being here. But there's a lot of people that belong in this house of God that's sitting at home and they're making up excuses. Well, I can't go today because my, my hair on the back of my head hurts. Beautiful excuse. Shave your head. Come to church. I've heard people say, well, if I go to church, the roof would fall in. And I always tell them, I'll take that chance. Plus, we, we expect you at church. I used to have on the sign out front when we used to change it by hand <clears throat> at a church I pastored in Alabama. Visitors welcome, members expected. You should have seen my folks get up in arms about that. Well, that's not nice, preacher. I said, it's true though, isn't it? I never heard another word. I expect my members. I expect Christians to be in church. Why did I tell you this this morning? Because we need to learn from Palm Sunday. Not much has changed in 2,000 plus years. For it's deja vu all over again. As we come to the end of this message, I'd like to ask you this. Have you dedicated yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ and meant it? Is there anything in this world that could turn you away from the church? Is there anything in this world that can make you quit serving Jesus? Now be careful. You're in the wrong company. Here's another question. If you are dedicated to the Lord, are you serving Him? I've heard people say, well, preacher, I, I, I don't have any talents. And you know that's just a lie. Everybody's got talents and God would have already killed you and took you to heaven. He didn't leave you here because we need to see you. He left you here because he wanted the church to grow and you to be a part of making that happen. So we need to get busy serving, folks, and quit making excuses. And then someone's going to say, well, I've just been through so much. No, you haven't. Until you have gone through what Jesus Christ went through from the time that He came to this world, but even more so from the time He rode into Jerusalem until He was crucified on Friday. You don't know what it is to go through anything. Here's what I'm trying to tell you, folks. What a wonderful time today to rededicate our life to Christ. Say, Lord, I'm going to serve you. I'm not going to make any more excuses. What a wonderful time if you're not saved to say, Jesus, come into my heart. Take control of my life and be my Lord and Savior. What a wonderful time to bow before him in prayer. And say, Lord, my blessings are too many to count. You have been so good to me. And I love you so dearly. You see, folks, in just a few weeks, we're going to see what only God can do in revival. And it starts right here this morning. If they're not fire on the pews, there'll be no fire in the pulpit. If there's not an obvious, noticeable difference in everybody in this church when people look at us from the outside, there won't be nobody coming to revival. To visit. You see, I'm going to close. By saying simply this. Don't you ever shout Hosanna. And then turn around in a few days. And shout crucify him. Through the way that you live your life. And you act. Toward Jesus.
Would you stand with me now for our closing prayer? Father God, I'm just so thankful today that you love us enough to keep loving us in spite of us. But Lord, we, we're so human. And I'm so grateful that you understand that because you didn't come here as God's Son only. You came here as a 100% flesh and blood man. And the Bible tells us that you experienced everything, every sin that we've ever been tempted with, but yet you sin not. So that means, Lord, through you and your love, we can reach that place. Dear God, if there's one that's lost, save them. Those that need a church home, add them to the church. And dear God, help us not to walk around with a fizz on our face and malice in our heart. And dear God, help us not to approach this revival with saying, well, it's just going to be another bunch of meetings and nothing's going to happen. Because dear God, I don't believe that. I won't believe that. I won't accept that. I believe you're going to do something that only you can do. Now whatever decisions need to be made here this morning, dear God, Bring them right now to your glory. This is your time. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>